What's up, y'all? Welcome to Civics Unlocked, the segment where we unlock political knowledge and lock up ignorance in all of its forms. This week, we are unlocking the Georgia Senate runoff. You ready? Let's unlock it. I saw the best description of voting this past November, and um, I've been using it ever since. The meme said, quote, voting is like a group project. You do your part, and then you have to wait and rely on the rest of the country to come through with their part of the work, hoping they did it right, end quote. And that is genius on so many levels, right? I personally hate group projects because I'm a perfectionist, right? I overanalyze everything. I double and triple check my work, making sure that it's my best. I quickly learned that everybody does not do that. And that literally makes me break out into hives. Thinking about the fact that someone may not work and produce their best and that that work is going to affect mine, it's just, it's too much. I can't, I can't. Which is why that's the perfect metaphor for voting group projects. Each of us has the option of choosing who we think will be the best representative for us in government. And yet there are people out there who choose the opposite of what we feel or who choose not even to make a choice. Yet every one of their decisions affects the rest of us. And that has been problematic many times. It's why we should all be active and informed citizens so that the possibility of negative effects is lessened. It's what I'm trying to do with the launch of this segment, helping to ensure that more people are politically literate, if you will. Now, when it comes to the Senate, I know that most people don't know who their senators are, let alone what these people do. You may know a few people like the big names, but again, you have no idea what these people do. So the first part of this series was an explanation of the racist history of runoff elections, right? Explaining the reason why Georgians have basically been told the equivalent of congratulations, we cured your cancer, but now we got to work on your kidney disease, right? They, <laughs> they have to do elections twice for most of modern history. They've been doing that. This episode, we're going to be exploring what a senator does and why you should even care about what they do. So let's unlock the Senate. In order to fully understand American government and how it works, you have to put yourself in the mind of a semi to ultra rich white guy who was sick of paying taxes to a king who was halfway across the world. Every part of our government was set up to do one of two things, in my opinion. The first, to ensure that no one could become a king and rule over them again. And the second, for those in power to retain their power. Now you can agree or disagree with me, but the fact that we have three branches of government that check each other proves my first point. And the fact that there are government officials who have been in power for three and four decades and the presence of runoff elections proves my second point. Anywho, back to the Senate. As I've mentioned before, there are three branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. We'll talk about the other two later on, but today's focus is on the first of the three branches, the legislative. It is this branch that created the position of senator through Article 1 of the Constitution, which was written during the Constitutional Convention on July 16th, 1787. On March 4th, 1789, the first session of Congress convened. Let's pause for a second to note. The legislative branch is comprised of two subdivisions, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Collectively, they're often referred to as Congress for short. The total Congress is made up of 535 members, 435 that are in the House of Representatives and 100 senators. So when you hear me say Congress, I'm referring to the 535 members. But when you hear me specify Senate or House, that's when I'm referring to an individual division. Got it? Good. Okay, so there are 100 senators because there's two from each state, regardless of the population size. This was decided in a compromise when the framers decided to split the way we choose our representatives. So in the House, the lower chamber of Congress, they're chosen by the population of the state. But in the Senate, there are two representatives from each state, regardless. Fun fact, 
prior to 1913 and the ratification or the adoption of the 17th Amendment, senators were selected by their state legislatures. This type of election pretty much ensured that those who were elected were men who already had prominence within their party and within their state. Not much has changed in that regard. Anywho, the legislative branch was created to be the most powerful branch. The longer you stay, the more power you yield, which is why so many people get in and stay in if they don't advance to higher positions. 19 senators have went on to become president, so it's definitely a proving stepping stone. The word senate actually comes from the ancient Roman term senex, which means old. <laughs> Is funny. I kid you not. It means old. Referring to the elders assembly, speaking to the concept of listening to the wisdom of the elders, which is actually pretty funny when you consider that the average age of the current Senate is 62.9 years. Guess they took that literally. Anyway, um, to become a senator, one must be at least 30 years old, a citizen for at least nine years, a resident in the state that they want to represent. Passing those qualifications and having enough money to run a campaign, senators are elected by the people within their state. Now, since elections are state-run, how those elections are handled varies based on the state, as we've previously discussed. Now, once they're in office, there is no limit to the amount of terms they can serve, which can cause problems. But each term is six years. However, in what the framers called a staggered election scheme, one third of the U.S. Senate is always up for re-election or election, while the remaining two thirds remain as a stabilizing force. If a senator dies or resigns before the end of the term, the state legislature may authorize the governor to appoint someone to fill the vacancy until the next election. And we see that play out in Georgia. Right now, each senator represents his or her entire state. And while in Washington, they're supposed to represent the needs of their constituents back home. And this is where things get tricky because they're away from the people who elected them. Oftentimes they can forget that they're actually in Washington to do what's best for you and not what's best for themselves. So they're in Washington now. Right. What the heck are they doing there? Well, when we discuss the duties and powers of the Senate, it's hard to separate it from those of the House of Representatives as well, because they were meant to work together, despite some variations. But I'm going to try my best to focus strictly on the Senate. So the main powers of the Senate are to, one, conduct impeachment proceedings against high federal officials. High federal officials, meaning Supreme Court justices, judges, other members of Congress, and the president. And in order to remove said high federal official, a vote must be cast with a total of two thirds of the Senate voting to remove the individual. The second thing is they have the power to advise and consent on treaties, again, with a two thirds vote. And lastly, they approve or reject the president's appointments by a majority vote. This means judges, ambassadors, cabinet secretaries will be seeing this played out over the next couple of months. Now, the duties of the Senate include holding meetings, attending hearings, voting on bills that have reached the floor, and hopefully communicating with their constituents and doing media appearances to promote or complain about bills and current happenings within the Senate. Depending on the time and what's happening in the country, their duties can vary as we've seen over the last year dealing with COVID. Once elected to the Senate, they are assigned to at least one committee by the leadership of their party. Every senator sits on a committee because they are where legislation is decided on, drafted, and edited. There are 26 committees and the chairs of these committees are where most of the power lies. Usually the committee they're assigned to has to deal with the issues concerning their state or their area of expertise. But most times they're assigned based off of seniority. The longer you've been in the city, the better committee assignment you have. The committees are broken up into sections that cover the major areas of the nation, including agriculture, judiciary, education and foreign relations. The goal is for each committee to do their part so that they can come together and affect the whole of the American population. Although the goal is to have everyone work together despite party affiliation, the leadership positions within the Senate are divided among the two parties. 
At the top, the vice president of the United States serves as the president of the Senate. Currently, Mike Pence serves as the vice president and president of the Senate. Since most times there's a clear distinction between the party that's in majority and one that's in the minority, the VP doesn't usually show up for votes or floor discussions because a tie doesn't need to be broken. So within the day-to-day operations of the Senate, there is a president pro tempore, which means for the time being, literally. Um, Basically, it's a temporary Senate president who serves in the vice president's absence. Republican Senator Chuck Grassley from Iowa currently holds this position, making him third in the line of succession should something happen to the president, coming after the VP and Speaker of the House, who is Nancy Pelosi. Then there is the majority leader. That's the person whose party is in the majority, right? This individual controls the Senate. They schedule the business. They decide which bills get voted on or brought to the floor for debate. They also have the right to be heard first on any debate. It is easily the most powerful position within the Senate. Addison Mitchell McConnell, Republican senator from Kentucky, currently holds this position. Yes, his first name is Addison. But here at Civics Unlocked in Danae's Dialogue, we refer to him as Senator Evil Squidward. Okay, the man called himself the Grim Reaper of the Senate, so you can decide whether that's an opinion or a fact. On the other side, there is a minority leader, which is the head of the minority party. Uh, Democrat Senator Chuck Schumer from New York currently holds this title. He would take over as a majority leader should Warnock and Ossoff win their elections. Now, in a normal world, the majority and the minority leaders are supposed to work together to meet often and decide on legislation. But there's not too much bipartisanship happening these days because Senator Evil Squidward has been at the head of the Republican Party in Congress since 2007. He went from being the minority leader to the majority leader and has held his position since 2015. Anywho, in addition to these positions, there is the majority and minority whip. Senator John Dune of South Dakota and Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois serve in these positions, respectively. Whips serve as the go-between. From the party leaders and the remaining members of the Senate, kind of like vice principals, they're responsible for whipping the Senate together for votes and for meetings. They can also stand in for the majority and minority leaders. The majority and minority leaders and the president pro tempore receive an annual salary of $193,400. To the regular Senate members, $174,000. The Speaker of the House gets $223,500 a year. So Nancy is sitting pretty right now. The increase in pay is just another incentive to get and keep one's power. Don't believe me? Let's go back to Senator Evil Squidward. Like I said, he's been the majority leader for 15 years. That's half my life. But he's been in the Senate? For 35 years, that's more than my life. (laughs) Oh, wow. And he's just the 24th out of 25 longest serving senators in U.S. history. Democratic Senator of West Virginia, Robert Byrd, served 51 years in the Senate. That's longer than some people's lifetime. So depending on where you stand, this is part of the problem. The fact that these people can get into position and basically sit there until they die without risk of removal has led to the stagnation of Senate progress, and that hasn't been what's best for the country. So what can we do to change this? What does this all mean? How does it affect you, a Georgia voter, or you, a citizen of the United States? Well, there's really no greater example of the importance of the Senate than what we're seeing happening right now. Knowing what these senators should be doing, we can take a step back and look at the efficacy and the productivity of the current members of the Senate and hold them accountable. Knowing the Senate is a part of the legislative branch and is supposed to act as the check on the executive branch, a.k.a. the president, we can then ask ourselves if the 116th Congress as a whole and the 116th Senate did its job in that respect, right? The House impeached Trump. The Senate voted not to remove or convict him. 
they decided that they weren't going to pursue charges or even hear witnesses from the Russia investigation. So if you believe that Trump did nothing wrong, then you feel that the Senate did its job. But the opposite is also true. The current Senate that is led by Senator Evil Squidward has been holding up the passage of another stimulus package, which I will discuss in another episode. Right? It's legislation that would put much needed money in the pockets of suffering Americans, but they're still fighting over it. Which brings us to the conversation on representation. Biden's pick for his cabinet have been historical because they reflect the demographics of America. Hear what I just said. Biden's picks are historic because they're diverse. And therein lies the problem. It shouldn't be a historic or a bold decision to pick a female or a black person or an Asian or a minority or whatever and place them in leadership. Yet here we are. When leadership is reflective of the population, the possibility of policies that will actually impact the most vulnerable communities being implemented increase. This is because with proper representation comes a plethora of experiences and backgrounds that better relate to the average American. So take what's happening now as an example. The reason it took so long for the Senate to even think about passing another COVID relief bill was because of the current representatives. These are people who hold the power. These are people who are holding up votes because they're people who can't relate to the everyday life of the average working class American. They aren't struggling to pay their rent. They aren't in fear of losing their job. They don't know what it's like to instantly become teacher and parent, turning your kitchen into a classroom. But just because there isn't much representation there now doesn't mean it has to stay that way. However, historically, the Senate has not been representative of the demographics of America, with it being overwhelmingly older, white, male and rich. Thankfully, this is beginning to change as the 116th Congress that's in power right now until January 3rd is the most diverse Congress ever. Of the 100 senators within the 116th Congress, that's again, the current Congress, 25 of them are women. Three of them are black. This is going down to two since Kamala Harris is not going to be VP. Five of them are Latinx. Three are Asian, Indian, or Pacific Islander. And yes, one of those includes Kamala Harris. Of the newly elected senators, the average age is 58.1 years. Republican Senator Josh Howley from Missouri is 41 years old. He's the youngest. (laughs) Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein of California is, get this, 87 years old, making her the oldest senator. Now, on the House side, Democrat Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York is the youngest, being 31. And the oldest is Republican Don Young of Arkansas, who is also 87. Now, the incoming 117th Congress builds on that diversity. It would also take the place as being the most diverse Congress in history. Yes, it's showing sign of progress, but there's still there's still so much more work to do. That's why choosing senators who can relate to the people who they represent is crucial. What would this quarantine have looked like had there been people who truly wanted the best for their constituents and be willing to fight for them? So not only is the Senate runoff important for Georgia, but because of the results of the general election in November, it's vital to the country and the success and efficiency of the Biden administration. Told you I was going to explain it to you. Here's why. Since the Democratic Party did not gain the amount of Senate seats that they needed to ensure a majority within the Senate, currently it is still in Republican control, with them having 50 seats to the Democrats' 48 seats. This two-seat deficit means that the Republicans, under the leadership of Senator Evil Squidward, a.k.a. Addison Mitchell McConnell, are still in power. And this is not good. If the Republican Party retains their majority, they will have the power to block all of the legislation coming from the Biden administration. It will pass the House, but it will not pass the Senate, meaning that it cannot be enacted into law. And this isn't an option. Now, I'm not speaking from opinion here. This is pure facts. And we can look at the Obama administration from 2010 to 2017. They refused to work with him and blocked everything. Even during the Trump administration, most to all of the Democratic legislation is still sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk as we speak, which is why 
everyone is paying attention to Georgia. Because of the Senate election there, there's a possibility that the Republican majority doesn't have to become and stay a reality. So in order to even have the possibility of productivity, the Democrats need to win both Senate seats in Georgia. If they lose just one, the Republicans will still be in the majority. However, if the two Democrats are elected and the rest of the Senate members vote what's best for their constituents, then they can cast their votes with the party and Kamala Harris as VP and president of the Senate can break the tie in favor of the Democrats, ensuring progress and legislation that's actually passed. Got it? Republican majority equals bad. Democrat majority equals good. And again, I'm not saying this to be partisan. I'm saying that based on the facts that tell me it is true. The Republican-controlled Senate will go down as the least productive in history. Common Cause reports that only 1% of 15,000 bills have been enacted from January 3rd, 2019 to roughly September of this year, which amounts to about 158 enacted laws. Senator Evil Squidward has continued to block legislation that has often passed the House with bipartisan support because he feels like they're too left wing. He has bragged on Fox News that there are 395 bills sitting on his desk that are not going to even be called up for a vote, let alone being passed, which is the main reason why we need Warnock and Ossoff in office, because we can't afford four or six more years of this same. And admittedly, the Republican leadership has already said that that's what we can expect with the Republican-led Senate. So, as I said before, this isn't an endorsement of the Democrats. This is a statement of facts. It's a choice between change and stagnation. And in the words of Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, change can't wait. And with that, we've unlocked the Senate runoff elections. Hopefully you've gained a key that you can use to unlock more doors that lead to change. If you're looking for more information or if you want to download the CAP, that's the Citizens Action Plan, that is for patrons only. You have to become a patron. You can go on www.patreon.com slash Danae's Dialogue. And for just $5 a month, you will receive extra and exclusive content. Also, if you have enjoyed this content, please subscribe, like, and share. And if you have any questions or if you'd like for me to discuss any topics, you can go to the Civics Unlocked page on Danae's Dialogue.com. Until next time, keep walking in your power.